Chapter Nineteen of the Splendid Wayfaring by John G. Nyhart. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Phil Schempf. The First Americans Overland to California. Immediately upon taking over Ashley's interests in the mountains, Smith, Jackson, and Sublette began to make plans for extending the business. The country drained by the Green, the Bear, the Weber, and the Upper Snake Rivers was still rich in beaver but yonder between the great salt lake and the setting sun lay a land unknown what incalculable wealth of fur might be waiting there in a trapper's paradise of pleasant valleys and somewhere through that country did not the mighty buenaventura river flow westward to the pacific here was stuff enough for the fashioning of big dreams beyond that unknown land was california might it not be possible to transport furs to some Spanish port, thence to be sent around the Horn by the New England trading ships that were constantly on the coast in those years? It will be remembered that in the late fall of 1824, Jedediah Smith had accompanied Ross to Flathead House, the Hudson Bay Company post on Clark's Fork of the Columbia, east of the Bitterroot Mountains while there he had learned much regarding the successful operations of the british traders and he could not have failed to appreciate the immense advantage they enjoyed with their access to the sea by way of the columbia it was natural that the young americans should covet a like advantage especially as the memory of astor's great enterprise that had failed but twelve years before was fresh in their minds and still bore the glamour of high adventure might not the Buenaventura prove to be a second Columbia? It was decided that an exploring party should be sent through the unknown country to the sea. Three years had passed since Jedediah Smith, who was now just twenty-eight years old, had joined Ashley's band at St. Louis, and from the beginning he had been a man of mark. His conduct in the first battle with the Rees, and his perilous journey afterward to Major Henry at the mouth of the Yellowstone, had distinguished him for extraordinary courage, and since that time he had demonstrated shrewdness in business manners, common sense, and a gift for leadership. For these reasons, and because, being better educated than either of his comrades, he was the best fitted to deal with the Spanish authorities on the coast, it was decided that he should lead the exploring party. We can fancy with what eagerness he must have accepted this task, for had he not poured over the vast triangular white space on the maps of the period and dreamed of penetrating its mystery now the dream was coming true however judging by the direction he took on his outward journey it would seem that his first concern was with finding a practicable route to california on the twenty second of august eighteen twenty six smith started southward from the place of rendezvous on great salt lake with fifteen men fifty horses and a stock of merchandise leaving his partners jackson and sublette with the remainder of the band to continue operations in the fur country already explored and agreeing to meet them if possible at the southern end of bear lake during the summer of eighteen twenty seven those who accompanied smith are worthy of remembrance for they were the first americans to reach california by land the vanguard of the great invasion that was to be in full swing a quarter of a century later their names are as follows Harrison G. Rogers, Silas Goebel, Arthur Black, John Gator, Robert Evans, Manuel Lazarus, John Hanna, John Wilson, Martin McCoy, Daniel Ferguson, Peter Rene, a Negro, Abraham LaPlante, James Reed, John Rubasco, and one Robuso. Following the valley of the Jordan River from Great Salt Lake, Smith's party skirted the eastern shore of Utah Lake. Having reached the point where the lake shore bears westward, they struck out across the barren country to the southwest, and in early September came upon the Sevier River, flowing in a northerly direction. Smith called this Ashley's River, and assumed that it emptied into Utah Lake, a natural assumption considering the direction of the stream and the fact that he had reached it at a considerable distance south of the abrupt bend from which it flows southwesterly into Sevier Lake. Just fifty years before, the two Franciscan padres, Dominguez and Escalante, in their misguided search for a direct route from Santa Fe to Monterey, had passed that way with a party of eight, 
en route to utah lake since then no white men had penetrated that solitude until now smith's band pushed on southward up the valley of the sevier the last signs of buffalo had been seen before leaving utah lake but antelope and mountain sheep were still to be found in small numbers and black-tailed hares were abundant so that the men as yet did not suffer want while ascending this stream they came upon a small village of sandpat indians called sandpatch by smith the fact that these wore rabbit skin robes is sufficient indication that big game was very scarce in that region few in numbers and poverty-stricken it is not surprising that this tribe was friendly disposed toward the white men who must have seemed immensely rich and powerful with their buckskin clothes their rifles and their pack animals laden with merchandise from the headwaters of the sevier the explorers crossed the divide southward and near the end of september reached the headwaters of the virgin of a muddy cast and a little brackish which smith called adams river in compliment to our president with mountains to their left and a sandy waste broken by occasional rocky hills on their right they descended the virgin through a country where even jackrabbits were scarce they now began to know hunger and their horses grew lean and weak for want of grass nor did their meeting with the Paiute Indians bring them much relief. These, like the sand pets on the Sevier, wore rabbit skin robes and were poor, though we are told that they raised some little corn and pumpkins. After ten days of marching down the Virgin, so Smith tells us, he discovered a large cave on the west side of the river, the entrance of which is about ten or fifteen feet high and five or six feet in width the roof sides and floor being solid rock salt two days farther downstream through a region where little grew but cacti and stunted shrubs they reached the point where the virgin empties into the colorado crossing the colorado which smith calls the seed skeeter siskidi thus identifying it with green river the band traveled down the valley four days finding the country remarkably barren rocky and mountainous we are not told how they managed to exist during this time but it is reasonable to assume that they lived on horse meat at length they came upon the mojave indians whom smith calls the amuchavas dwelling in a place where the valley opening out to a width of from five to fifteen miles was well timbered and fertile the mojaves were well supplied with corn beans pumpkins watermelons and wheat i was now nearly destitute of horses says smith and had learned what it was to do without food i therefore remained there fifteen days and recruited my men and i was enabled also to exchange my horses and purchase a few more of a few runaway indians who stole some from the spaniards i here got information of the spanish countries the californias obtained two good guides and recrossed the seed skeeter which i afterwards found emptied into the gulf of california by the name of the colorado having crossed the colorado at needles during the first week of november smith and his band struck out across the desert i traveled the west course fifteen days he says over a country of complete barrens generally traveling from morning until night without water i crossed a salt plain about twenty miles long and eight wide on the surface was a crust of beautiful white salt quite thin under this surface there is a layer of salt from a half to one and a half inches in depth between this and the upper layer there is about four inches of yellowish sand anyone who has crossed the mojave desert on the atchison topeka and santa fe railroad the route of which is approximately that followed by smith can easily imagine what hardships were suffered by this party they had started from great salt lake with fifty horses and though they had purchased a number while resting among the mojave indians they had but eighteen when they reached the spanish settlements of california some had doubtlessly been eaten but most had died for want of pasturage and water on sunday evening november twenty sixth eighteen twenty six smith's party encamped on a point about eighteen miles east of san gabriel mission situated near the pueblo of los angeles the next morning so says harrison g rogers in his journal we got ready as early as possible and started a west course and traveled fourteen miles and encamped for the day we passed innumerable herds of cattle 
horses and some hundreds of sheep we passed four or five indian lodges that their indians act as herdsmen there came an old indian to us that speaks good spanish and took us with him to his mansion which consisted of two rows of large and lengthy buildings that remind me of the british barracks so soon as we encamped there was plenty to eat a fine young cow killed and plenty of corn meal given us pretty soon after the two commandants of the missionary establishment san gabriel came to us and had the appearance of gentlemen mr smith went with them to the mansion mission and i stayed with the company there was great feasting among the men as they were pretty hungry not having any good meat for some time the next day so rogers continues mr smith wrote me that he was received as a gentleman and treated as such and that he wished me to go back and look for a pistol that was lost and send the company on to the missionary establishment i complied with his request went back and found the pistol and arrived late in the evening was received very politely and showed into a room and my arms taken from me about ten o'clock at night supper was served and mr smith and myself sent for i was introduced to the two priests over a glass of good old whiskey and found them to be very jovial friendly gentlemen the supper consisted of a number of different dishes served different from any table i ever saw plenty of good wine during supper before the cloth was removed cigars were introduced it was a strange society into which these american trappers had come almost like men from another planet their trail from st louis up the missouri the platte and the sweetwater through south pass to salt lake by way of the bear river past utah lake up the sevier down the virgin and colorado and westward across the mojave desert had led them far as to space but farther as to time for they had actually journeyed backward through the past of the race to a pastoral theocratic age at this point a brief sketch of early california history may not come amiss in fifteen forty three juan cabrillo a spanish navigator had explored the southern coast of upper california then and for many years thereafter supposed to be an island or an archipelago with an extension of the gulf of california on the east and the mythical strait of anion an arm of hudson bay on the north in the eighties and nineties of the same century two spanish galleons trading with the philippines from the west coast of mexico had touched upon the california shore and in sixteen o two sebastian viscaino had discovered the bays of san diego and monterey for over a century and a half thereafter the country though regarded as belonging to the spanish crown was unvisited and remained little more than a name associated with the northern mystery now and then a galleon homeward bound from the philippines sighted its lonely headlands afar and sailed on in the middle of the eighteenth century the russians began the exploration of alaska and spain fearing the new influence growing up in the far north alarmed at the increasing frequency with which the english privateers were appearing in the pacific and having long felt the need of a refitting port for her manila galleons was aroused to a new interest in the land that she had so long neglected and decided to occupy it at this time however the spanish government was too poor to undertake the conquest of the vast domain by force of arms and so the task was delegated to the franciscan order of missionary friars i b richmond remarks upon the singular efficacy of the cross in the subjugation of men a fact which the spanish religious orders had already demonstrated in the philippine islands paraguay and lower california the leader of the great movement which now began was the famous father Junipero serra in seventeen sixty eight he accompanied the sacred expedition under jose de galvez the purpose of which was to establish missions at certain strategic points along the california coast the first san diego de alcala was founded in july seventeen sixty nine the second san carlos borromeo near the present monterey in seventeen seventy the third san antonio de padua on the san antonio river in july seventeen seventy one and san gabriel archangel the fourth in september of the same year from that time on the movement had grown rapidly at the time of jedediah smith's arrival there were twenty-three thriving missions in upper california 
reaching from the bay of san francisco to san diego bay of these san gabriel was one of the most important owing to the fertility of the region and to the fact that there the overland route from the colorado river met the trail from lower california in spite of the undeniably pious intentions of the padres these missions had grown to be something more than religious institutions concerned with the salvation of the indian soul they were commercial concerns under theocratic control and flourishing by virtue of a practically unlimited supply of slave labor the indian neophytes tended the flocks and herds spun wool tanned hides made tallow and soap raised wheat hemp grapes olives oranges and manufactured various articles in leather wood and iron a profitable trade in hides and tallow had for many years been carried on with the boston ships that came around the horn a voyage that often required as much as six months to make r h dana in two years before the mast has left us a vivid account of that industry as it was carried on along the coast during the period with which we are concerned four years before smith's arrival the province of upper california had given allegiance to mexico which had broken away from spain in eighteen eleven now the cordial reception of the first overland americans by the benevolent and lovable padres of san gabriel mission proved to be somewhat misleading for there was another power in the country with which the party was obliged to reckon the civil authorities as we have seen the first settlements in california had been founded as the result of suspicion and fear suspicion of the russians fear of the british buccaneers of the type of hawkins and drake since the ship otter of boston had dropped anchor in the bay of monterey just thirty years before the americans had come to be regarded with some dread and not without cause as history has long since made plain and as the conduct of the boston smugglers and traders along the coast had already demonstrated we americans are a virile driving breed and we must have seemed rather grasping and godless to the ease-loving spaniards of the coast in those days why had these barbaric trappers from the central wilds of the continent entered california was a new race of goths looking lustfully upon a new italy immediately upon arriving at san gabriel smith was informed that he could not proceed without a passport from the civil authorities and accordingly he wrote a letter to the governor of the province jose maria de aquian dia whose official residence was then at san diego giving reasons for his presence in the country and asking permission to continue his journey northward smith's reasons seem to have been rather more strategic than factual and considering those with whom he had to deal he was doubtless justified in making them so the governor was given to understand that the party had been compelled for want of provisions and water to enter california though an answer was expected within a few days more than a month was to elapse before satisfactory arrangements could be made with Echiandia. and knowing this we may as well pass the time among the luxury-loving padres with harrison g rogers here follow extracts from his diary november twenty ninth still at the mansion mission we were sent for about sunrise to drink a cup of tea and eat some bread and cheese they all appear friendly and treat us well although they are catholics by profession they allow us the liberty of conscience and treat us as they do their own countrymen and brethren about eleven o'clock dinner was ready and the priest came after us to go and dine we were invited into the office and invited to take a glass of gin and water and eat some bread and cheese directly after we were seated at dinner and everything went on in style both the priests being pretty merry the clerk and one other gentleman who speaks some english they all appeared to be gentlemen of the first class both in manners and habits the mission consists of four rows of houses forming a complete square where there are all kinds of mechanics at work the church faces the east and the guard house the west the north and south line comprises the workshops they have large vineyards apple and peach orchards and some orange and fig trees they manufacture blankets and sundry other articles they distill whiskey and grind their own grain having a water mill of tolerable quality they have upwards of one thousand persons employed men women and children indians of various nations the situation is very handsome pretty streams of water running through from all quarters 
some thousands of acres of fertile land as level as a die in view and a part under cultivation surrounded on the north with a high mountain handsomely timbered with pine and cedar and on the south with low mountains covered with grass cattle this mission has upward of thirty thousand head of cattle and horses sheep hogs etc in proportion they slaughter at this place from two to three thousand head of cattle at a time the mission lives on the profits november thirtieth there was a wedding in this place to-day and mr smith and myself invited the bell was rung a little before sunrise and the morning service performed then the music commenced serenading the soldiers firing etc about seven o'clock tea and bread served about eleven dinner and music the ceremony and dinner were held at the priests they had an elegant dinner consisting of a number of dishes boiled and roast meat and fowl wine and brandy grapes brought as a dessert mr smith and myself acted quite independent not understanding their language nor they ours we endeavoured to apologize being very dirty and not in a situation to shift our clothing but no excuse would be taken they treated us as gentlemen in every sense of the word and although our apparel is so indifferent and we not being in circumstances at this time to help ourselves being about eight hundred miles on a direct line from the place of our deposit our two indian guides were imprisoned in the guardhouse the second day after we arrived at the missionary establishment and remain confined as yet december first eighteen twenty six we still remain at the mission of san gabriel things going on as usual all friendship and peace mr smith's at his blacksmith's james reed and silas goble to work in the blacksmith's shop to make a bear trap for the priest agreeable to promise yesterday mr smith and the interpreter went in the evening to the next mission called san pedro on san pedro bay a spanish gentleman from the mission having sent his servant with horses for them mr smith informed me this morning that he had to give reed a little flogging yesterday evening on account of some impertinence he appeared more complacent this morning than usual december second mr smith has not returned from the mission as yet this province is called the province of new california this mission ships annually from twenty to twenty five thousand dollars worth of hides and tallow and about twenty thousand dollars worth of soap the indians appear to be much altered from the wild indians in the mountains that we have passed they are kept in great fear for the least offence they are corrected they are complete slaves in every sense of the word mr smith and laplante returned late in the evening and represent their treatment to be good at the other mission mr smith tells me that mr francisco the spanish gentleman that he went to visit promises him as many horses and mules as he wants december fourth still at san gabriel things much as usual the priest presented mr smith with two pieces of shirting containing sixty-four yards for to make the men shirts all being nearly naked december seventh no answer as yet from the governor of the province mr smith and all hands getting impatient december eighth mr smith was sent for to go to san diego to see the governor captain cunningham commanding the ship courier now lying in the port at san diego arrived here late this evening the captain is a bostonian and has been trading on the coast for hides and tallow since june last he informs me that he is rather under the impression that he shall be obliged to remain until some time in the succeeding summer in consequence of so much opposition as there are a number of vessels on the coast trading for the same articles mr martinez tells me that there are between sixteen and seventeen thousand natives that are converted to the catholic faith and under the control of the different missions the white population he estimates at six thousand making twenty-two or twenty-three thousand souls in the province of new california december ninth mr smith and one of the men in company with captain cunningham left san gabriel this morning for san diego the governor's place of residence december tenth sunday there were five indians brought to the mission and sentenced to be whipped for not going to work when ordered each received from twelve to fourteen lashes they were all old men say from fifty to sixty years the commandant standing by with his sword to see the indian who flogged them did his duty 
they keep at this place four small field pieces two six-pounders and two two-pounders to protect them from the indians in case they should rebel december thirteenth i walked through the workshops i saw some indians blacksmithing some carpentering others making the woodwork of ploughs others employed in making spinning wheels for the squaws to spin on there are upwards of sixty women employed in spinning yarn and weaving our blacksmiths have been employed for several days making horseshoes and nails for our own use when we leave here december fourteenth i was asked by the priest to let our blacksmiths make a large trap for him to set in his orange garden to catch the indians when they come up at night to rob his orchard december eighteenth i received a letter from mr smith informing me that he was rather under the impression that he would be detained for some time yet as the general did not like to take the responsibility on himself to let us pass until he received instructions from the general in mexico our men have been employed in fitting out a cargo of hides tallow and soap for a mr henry edwards he is what they call here a mexican trader december nineteenth this mission if properly managed would be equal to a mine of silver or gold their farms are extensive they raise from three thousand to four thousand bushels of wheat annually and sell to shippers for three dollars per bushel the annual income situated as it is and managed so badly by the indians is worth in hides tallow soap wine brandy wheat and corn from fifty five to sixty thousand dollars december twentieth i expect an answer from mr smith in six or eight days if he does not get permission to pass on my situation is a very delicate one as i have to be among the grandees of the country every day i make a very grotesque appearance when seated at table amongst the dandies with their ruffles silks and broadclothes january sixth eighteen twenty seven this being what is called epiphany or old christmas day church held early as usual men women and children attend after church the ceremonies as on sundays wine issued abundantly to both spaniards and indians music played by the indian band after the issue of the morning our men in company with some spaniards went and fired a salute and the old padre gave them wine bread and meat as a treat some of the men got drunk and two of them james reed and daniel ferguson commenced fighting and some of the spaniards interfered and struck one of our men by the name of black which came very near terminating with bad consequences our blacksmith james reed came very abruptly into the priest's dining room while at dinner and asked for brandy the priest ordered a plate of victuals to be handed to him he ate a few mouthfuls and set the plate on the table and then took up the decanter of wine and drank without invitation and came very near breaking the glass when he set it down the padre seeing he was in a state of inebriety refrained from saying anything monday january eighth last night there was a great fandango or dance among the spaniards they kept it up till nearly daylight wednesday january tenth about noon mr smith captain cunningham mr shaw and thomas dodge came to the mission from the ship courier and i was much rejoiced to see them as i have been waiting with anxiety to see him so runs a portion of the diary of harrison g rogers a western peeps after weeks of trying negotiations with the suspicious and procrastinating authorities smith with the aid of captain cunningham and several other new england seamen then on the coast managed to get permission to proceed on his way from san diego he sailed to the port of san pedro on board the courier with captain cunningham and by the middle of january eighteen twenty seven we find him at the pueblo de los angeles engaged in buying horses for his journey on the sixteenth of january smith returned to the mission from the pueblo with the horses he had purchased there during the following day preparations were made for resuming the journey and old father sanchez who had already given much to the visitors outdid himself in generosity when the band was ready to start daniel ferguson who was evidently well pleased with southern california and had no desire to experience any further hardships in the wilderness could not be found john wilson also remained at san gabriel probably by arrangement with smith 
on the eighteenth of january eighteen twenty seven the party now consisting of fourteen men including smith set out northwestward with sixty-eight horses which being for the most part unbroken soon became unmanageable and ran eight or ten miles with the packs before they could be stopped camp was made that night at the indian farmhouse where the party had passed the night of november twenty seventh eighteen twenty six and smith and rogers returned to the mission for a farewell supper with the friendly padres travelling in a northeasterly direction for the next two days they made camp within four miles of san bernardino where says rogers we have an order from the governor and our old father joseph sanchez for all the supplies we stand in need of here some days were spent in purchasing provisions drying meat making pack saddles breaking horses and in rounding up the troublesome herd which broke away several times thence pushing on in a northwesterly direction up the great central valley for a distance of about three hundred miles in early spring the party reached a river which smith called the wimulchi after a tribe of indians found there authorities differ as to the identity of this stream chittenden believed it to be the merced and richmond the mokelemi but dale gives us what seems to be conclusive arguments in favor of the stanislaw smith eager to reach the place of rendezvous agreed upon with jackson and sublette now undertook to cross the sierras his chosen route which is not definitely known probably ran twenty-five or thirty miles north of the yosemite valley i found the snow so deep on mount joseph he wrote to general clark that i could not cross my horses five of which starved to death i was compelled therefore to return to the valley which i had left and there leaving my party i started with two men seven horses and two mules and provisions for ourselves and started on the twentieth of may and succeeded in crossing it in eight days having lost only two horses and one mule i found the snow on the top of this mountain from four to eight feet deep but it was so consolidated by the heat of the sun that my horses only sunk from half a foot to one foot deep one of the men who accompanied smith is known to have been the blacksmith silas gobel his other companion is nowhere named as such however by collating the lists of those who are known to have been or must have been in the parties of eighteen twenty six eighteen twenty seven and eighteen twenty eight it appears that smith's other companion could have been no other than robeso after travelling twenty days from the east side of mount joseph continues smith's letter i struck the southwest corner of great salt lake travelling over a country completely barren and destitute of game we frequently travelled without water sometimes for two days over sandy deserts where there was no sign of vegetation and when we found water in some of the rocky hills we most generally found some indians who appeared the most miserable of the human race having nothing to subsist on nor any clothing except grass seed grasshoppers etc when we arrived at the salt lake we had but one horse and one mule remaining which were so feeble and poor that they could scarce carry the little camp equipage which i had along the balance of my horses i was compelled to eat as they gave out thus characteristically with few words smith describes what was unquestionably a great feat and what must have been a terrible experience twenty days of toil and suffering in an unknown desert and all summed up in one hundred fifty words most men would require more space for the discussion of an aching tooth with two companions smith had at last penetrated the great triangular white space of his dream he had found no pleasant valleys rich in beaver but he had been the first to travel the central route between great salt lake and the pacific ocean the road from the missouri river to san francisco bay was now open awaiting the wagons of the settlers and the official explorers end of chapter nineteen chapter twenty of the splendid wayfaring by john g nyhart this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by phil schampf smith's second journey on about the seventeenth of june eighteen twenty seven jedediah smith and his two companions having crossed the nevada deserts reached the southern end of salt lake from whence they hastened on to the southern end of bear lake the place chosen by the three partners for the summer rendezvous 
on july seventeenth we find smith still at the bear lake rendezvous writing a brief account of his recent journey to the superintendent of indian affairs general william clark shortly thereafter his second journey to california began his party consisted of nineteen men and two indian women the names of the men are as follows thomas virgin for whom the virgin river was named charles swift toussaint marechal john turner joseph palmer joseph lapointe thomas dawes richard taylor silas goble david cunningham francis Deramay, william campbell boson brown gregory ortaga john b rattel pale polite robuso isaac galbraith following the same route that he had taken the year before in late august smith reached the country of the mojave indians near the point where the thirty-fifth parallel crosses the colorado river it will be remembered that smith spent fifteen days with the mojaves on his way to california the year before having good reason to regard them as friendly he decided to spend a few days among them now resting his men and horses and purchasing supplies before beginning the difficult westward journey across the desert he could not know that during the past year these indians had been ordered by governor ekiandia to stop any americans who might attempt to pass that way after spending three days in peaceful trade with the mojaves smith prepared to resume his journey as on his previous trip he had crossed the colorado some distance above and was now on the east side of the river unconscious of treacherous intent on the part of his hosts he went about the task of transporting his party to the west bank by means of rafts made of bundles of reeds the indians very obligingly lending a hand smith and nine of his men had already crossed some of the party was still on the east shore and the remainder on the raft in midstream when at a signal the mojaves fell upon their departing guests the two indian women were taken captive thomas virgin was seriously wounded and the following ten who had not yet reached the west bank were massacred goble cunningham de campbell brown ortaga rattel pale polite and robuso all of smith's property and papers were lost there was nothing for the survivors to do but to flee into the desert to the west traveling both by night and by day they reached the spanish settlements near san gabriel mission in nine and one half days considering the fact that smith had spent fifteen days in covering the same ground on his former trip one can imagine the mood of desperation that drove him now immediately upon arriving at the settlements smith reported by letter to the proper authorities and having purchased some supplies for the party was destitute he pushed on northwestwardly up the central valley to join the band of eleven men that he had left in the region of the stanislaw river on its departure for salt lake in may of that year during the absence of their leader the little band had fared badly and smith found them half starved he and his companions were no better off and there was nothing to do but to place himself once more at the doubtful mercy of the spaniards so with two indian guides smith went to the mission of san jose a three days journey there he made his wants known and asked permission to go on to monterey where governor ekiandia was then residing he was arrested and thrown into a guardhouse from which however he was allowed to write to the captain of the upper province about two weeks passed before he received a letter from the governor inviting him to call then disarmed and guarded by four soldiers he set out for monterey where he arrived at midnight after a journey of three days again he was thrown into prison remaining there without food or water until the following noon when the governor sent for him as a result of the first interview smith obtained liberty of the limits of the town and harbor and of boarding with an american gentleman captain cooper of boston day after day passed by and still ekiandia could not make up his mind as to what should be done with this american trapper who had actually committed the crime of entering mexican territory at times it seemed that the intruder would be sent to mexico again he must leave the country by ship at other times the whole party yonder in the region of the stanislaw was to be summoned to monterey finally when it became apparent that the governor was quite incapable of a decision 
four american sea captains whose vessels were lying in the harbor took the matter into their own hands and appointed captain cooper agent for the united states cooper soon settled the matter and on november fifteenth eighteen twenty seven smith gave bond in the sum of thirty thousand dollars promising to leave the country within two months smith had left nineteen men encamped in the region of the stanislaw when he went to monterey and during his tedious negotiations with the governor these had been brought into san francisco where smith now joined them after purchasing some horses guns ammunition and other necessities thomas virgin who had been left in the south because of his wounds was sent for at about this time two of the men who seemed to have been isaac galbraith and the quarrelsome blacksmith james reed deserted leaving the following nineteen in the band that began the return journey early in december smith rogers virgin black lapointe dawes laplante swift turner gator hannah lazarus palmer rene the negro taylor mccoy rubasco marischal and evans trapping as they went these moved slowly up the sacramento river spending considerable time on the largest tributary of that stream which for that reason has since been called american fork it seems to have been smith's intention to cross the sierras as early in the spring as possible and return to salt lake through the unknown country lying north of his route of eighteen twenty seven but in april eighteen twenty eight after several unsuccessful attempts to find a practicable pass to the eastward he was forced to change his plan and make for the columbia he now left the sacramento valley striking out through the mountainous country in the direction of the coast by the thirteenth of may eighteen twenty eight he had crossed the trinity river near latitude forty degrees thirty minutes and reached the base of hoopa mountain the following extracts from the journal kept by rogers during this time will give some idea of the difficulties encountered by the party wednesday may fourteenth we made an early start directing our course northwest and travelled four miles and encamped on the top of a high mountain where there was but indifferent grass for the horses the travelling amazingly bad we descended one point of brushy and rocky mountain where it took us about six hours to get the horses down some of them falling about fifty feet perpendicular down a steep place into a creek one broke his neck a number of packs left along the trail as night was fast approaching and we were obliged to leave them and get what horses we could collected at camp a number more got badly hurt by the falls but none killed but this one that broke his neck saw some indians hoopas that crossed the river in a canoe and came to see us they appear afraid of horses they are very light-coloured indians quite small and talkative thursday fifteenth may eighteen twenty eight the men were divided into parties this morning some sent hunting as we have no meat in camp others sent back for the horses friday may sixteenth eighteen twenty eight we concluded that it was best to lie by today and send two men to look out a pass to travel as the country looks awful ahead and let our horses rest as there is plenty good grass about one mile off for them to feed on saturday may seventeenth the two men that were sent on discovery yesterday return this morning and say that we are fifteen or twenty miles from the north pacific ocean they report game plenty such as elk and deer they report the travelling favourable to what it has been for thirty or forty miles back the two men marischal and turner that were sent off yesterday killed three deer and captain smith has dispatched two men after the meat as the camp is almost destitute monday may nineteenth we made an early start this morning steering our course as yesterday six miles west and encamped on the side of the mountain the travelling some better than it was back although we have hills and brush to encounter yet we encamped about six miles from the ocean where we have a fair view of it tuesday may twentieth as our horses were lame and tired we concluded to remain here and let them rest and kill and dry meat as elk appeared to be plenty from the sign after breakfast myself and mr virgin started on horseback for the seashore 
following an Indian trail that led immediately there. After proceeding about five miles west, we found we could not get any further on horseback along the Indian trail, so we struck out from the creek that we had followed down, and about three miles from where we had first struck it. After leaving the creek with some considerable difficulty, we ascended a point of steep and brushy mountain that runs along parallel to the seashore, and followed that until we could get no further for rocks and brush. We got within eighty or one hundred yards of the beach, but being pretty much fatigued and not able to ride down on account of rocks and brush, we did not proceed any further in that direction. On our return we saw some elk. I went after them, and Mr. Virgin stayed with the horses. I did not get to fire on them, and saw a black bear, and made after him, and shot and wounded him very badly, and heard Mr. Virgin shoot and call me to come to him. I made all the haste I could in climbing the mountain to where Mr. Virgin was. He told me that some Indians had attacked him in my absence, shot a number of arrows at him, and wounded the horses. I rested a few minutes, and proceeded on cautiously to the place where he had left the horses, and found an Indian lying dead and his dog by him. Mr. Virgin's horse had two or three arrows in him, and he lying down. We got him up and made camp a little before night. Wednesday, May 21st, still at the same camp. The timber in this part of the country is principally hemlock, pine, and white cedar. The cedar trees from five to fifteen feet in diameter. The underbrush is hazel, oak, briars, currants, gooseberry, and scotch cap bushes, together with alder and sundry other shrubs too tedious to mention. The soil of the country is very rich and black, but very mountainous, which renders the traveling almost impossible with so many horses as we have. Thursday, May 22nd all hands up early and preparing for a move had the horses driven to camp and caught ready for packing up and it commenced raining so fast that we concluded to remain here today as we could not see to direct our course for fog along the mountains we have not seen or heard any indians since the twentieth when mr virgin killed the one that shot at his horse oh god may it please thee in thy divine providence to still guide and protect us through this wilderness of doubt and fear as thou hast done heretofore and be with us in the hour of danger and difficulty as all praise is due to thee and not to man oh do not forsake us lord but be with us and direct us through for nearly two weeks thereafter the party wandered about the rugged country seeking a way down to the coast and more than once they found it necessary to turn back over hard one miles because of some impassable barrier during this time they were forced to kill their last dog for food as they were entirely out of provisions with the exception of a few pounds of flour and rice finally on june eighth they managed to reach the ocean near the mouth of the klamath river and camped on the beach henceforth they kept to the coast sometimes riding at the very lip of the surf sometimes swinging a mile or so inland now and then the deep and yawning mouth of a stream made it necessary to build rafts game was somewhat more plentiful now and various articles of food such as camas root clams dried fish and berries were bought with beads from the indians who generally displayed rather more fear than friendliness and sometimes risked a sneaking hostility on the twenty third of june the party crossed the forty-second parallel the northern boundary of the mexican country under date of july second rogers tells us that as the most of the men's times expired this evening captain smith called all hands and gave them up their articles and engaged the following men to go on with him until he reaches the place of deposit viz john gatier arthur black john hannah emmanuel lazarus Abraham Laplante, Charles Swift, Thomas Dawes, Toussaint Marechal. Dawes time to commence when he gets well enough for duty. Also Peter René and Joseph Palmer at the above name price, one dollar per day, and Martin McCoy, two hundred dollars from the time he left the Spanish country until he reaches the deposit. On the 4th of July, so Rogers tells us, Marechal caught a boy about ten years old, and brought him to camp. 
i gave him some beads and dried meat he appears well satisfied still pushing northward along the coast on july eleventh the party reached the umpqua river and camped near a village of umpqua indians who seemed altogether friendly the last two entries made by rogers in his diary run as follows saturday july twelfth we commenced crossing the river early and had our goods and horses over by eight o'clock then packed up and started a northeast course up the river and traveled three miles and encamped had several indians along one of the indians stole an axe and we were obliged to seize him for the purpose of tying him before we could scare him to make him give it up captain smith and one of them caught him and put a cord around his neck and the rest of us stood with our guns ready in case they made any resistance there were about fifty indians present but they did not pretend to resist tying the other the river at this place is about three hundred yards wide and makes a large bay that extends four or five miles up in the pine hills we traded some land and sea otter and beaver fur in the course of the day those indians bring pacific raspberries and other berries sunday july thirteenth eighteen twenty eight we made a pretty good start this morning directing our course along the bay east and travelled four miles and encamped fifty or sixty indians in camp again to-day we traded fifteen or twenty beaver skins from them some elk meat and tallow also some lamprey eels the travelling quite miry in places we got a number of our pack horses mired and had to bridge several places a considerable thunder shower this morning and rain at intervals through the day those indians tell us after we get up the river fifteen or twenty miles we will have good travelling to the wyhamet or multanoma where the Kalapoo indians live while writing these words the last he would ever write rogers must have felt that his earnest prayers had been answered the wyhamet or multanoma was the willamette river a day or two of easy travel and they would be in the valley of that stream with a good trail leading northward down to the columbia and the great post of the hudson bay company fort vancouver both by trapping and through trade with the natives they had in spite of their hardships accumulated a large amount of beaver fur during their long northward journey through a virgin wilderness and though they were still far from their comrades under sublette and jackson the unknown country had been passed and henceforth they would travel by river valleys all the way to the headwaters of the snake where the main body would be waiting doubtless it was a merry company that camped on the north bank of the umpqua that night of july thirteenth eighteen twenty eight early the next morning smith as had been his habit started afoot up the river to find a good trail for his party the country being very swampy in the lowlands and woody in the mountains one account states that he went alone another that he went with a little englishman and an indian a third that he was accompanied by two of his party and one umpqua strict orders were given that no indians should be admitted to the camp during his absence but scarcely had he disappeared up river when the order was disobeyed the penalty for disobedience was swift and terrible on july twelfth it will be remembered smith had dealt rather roughly with the indian who had stolen an axe this man who happened to be a chief now seized the opportunity to avenge his wounded dignity at a signal from him the indians outnumbering the little band three to one attacked the unsuspecting trappers effective resistance was out of the question fifteen of the white men went down at once under the knives of the indians only two of those in camp escaped black and turner at the moment when the signal for the attack was given black who seems to have been out of the crowd had just cleaned and loaded his gun three indians leaped upon him but he succeeded in shaking them off and seeing his comrades down and fighting hopelessly he fired into the mass of indians and fled into the heavily wood country to the north turner a very large and powerful man was serving as cook that day having no weapon within reach when the savages fell upon him he snatched a burning stick from the fire knocked down four of his assailants and ran upstream in the direction taken by smith whom he met returning at some distance from the camp turner was under the impression that he was the sole survivor of the camp and realizing the impossibility of coping with their numerous enemies 
these fled together up the umqua and across the divide to the willamette black in the meantime was following the coast northward convinced that he alone had escaped in his autobiography dr mclaughlin factor of fort vancouver on the columbia gives the following account of the affair one night in august eighteen twenty eight i was surprised by the indians making a great noise at the gate of the fort saying that they had brought an american the gate was opened the man black came in but was so affected he could not speak after sitting down some minutes to recover himself he told us he was he thought the only survivor of eighteen men conducted by jedediah smith all the rest he thought were murdered broken down by hunger and misery as he had no food but a few wild berries which he found on the beach he determined to give himself up to the killamore a tribe on the coast of cape lookout who treated him with great humanity relieved his wants and brought him to the fort for which in case whites might again fall in their power and to induce them to act kindly to them i rewarded them most liberally but as smith and his two men might have escaped and if we made no search for them die at daybreak the next morning i sent indian runners with tobacco to the willamette chiefs to tell them to send their people in search of smith and his two men and if they found them to bring them to the fort and i would pay them and telling them if any indians hurt these men we would punish them and immediately equipped a strong party of forty well-armed men but as the men were embarking to our great joy smith and his two men arrived i then arranged as strong a party as i could make to recover all we could of smith's property i divulged my plan to none but gave written instructions to the officer to be opened early when he got to the umqua because if known before they got there the officers would talk of it among themselves the men would hear it and from them it would go to their indian wives who were spies on us and my plan would be defeated the plan was that the officer was as usual to invite the indians to bring their furs to trade just as if nothing had happened count the furs but as the american trappers mark all their skins keep these all separate give them to smith and not pay the indians for them telling them that they belong to him that they got them by murdering smith's people as a result of this expedition sent out from a principle of christian duty by dr mclaughlin smith recovered most of his peltry which he sold to the hudson bay company receiving therefore a draft on london for twenty thousand dollars some of the horses of the ill-fated party were also returned together with a few articles of personal property among which was the diary of harrison g rogers which we have been quoting in order to appreciate the magnanimity of dr mclaughlin it must be remembered that the firm of smith jackson and sublet was then coming to be regarded as a somewhat dangerous competitor and considering the manner in which the americans had relieved ogden of a fortune in furs during the spring of eighteen twenty five a lesser man than mclaughlin might have seized this opportunity to enjoy the discomfiture of his rivals in his pioneer days of oregon history s a clark who knew mclaughlin has left us the following tribute to this fine old gentleman over six feet in height powerfully made with a grand head on massive shoulders and long snow-white locks covering them he was a splendid picture of a man the indians knew him as the white eagle and they respected him as they never did any one else he was a convert to catholicism and in no sense was he a bigot or lacking in the christian charity that recognizes true effort with good will whenever it is met his policy to effect peace with the indians was potent for good with his grand manner and majestic port heightened by white waving hair he was the embodiment of power and justice he was indeed as he was styled the czar of the west his rule was imperial for a thousand miles and his mere word was law yet there was a genuine beneficence in his nature that overcame the pride of life and the lust of the flesh and made him the special providence to open the canaan of the occident to the civilization of the east End of chapter twenty Chapter Twenty One of the Splendid Wayfaring by John G. Nyhart. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 
Recording by Phil Schempf. The End of the Trail During the absence of Jedediah Smith, the main body of trappers under Sublette and Jackson had been working in the Upper Snake River country, and in the fall of 1828 they returned to Great Salt Lake for the winter. Shortly afterward, Sublette started for St. Louis with the furs, traveling by way of South Pass and the Platte. He reached his destination about the middle of December, 1828, and in March, 1829, began the return journey to the mountains with sixty men and a train of supplies. He ascended the North Platte to the Sweetwater, thence heading for the Popo Aggie, a southern tributary of the Wind River, where the summer rendezvous was to be held. Reaching the appointed place about July 1st, he found there a greater portion of the band that had wintered at Salt Lake. Jackson had remained with a small party west of the Great Divide. According to Joseph Meek, who made his first trip to the mountains that year, the rendezvous lasted until about the 1st of August. In this period, says Meek, the men, Indian allies, and other Indian parties who usually visited the camp at this time were all supplied with goods. The remaining merchandise was adjusted for the convenience of the different traders, who should be sent out through all the country traversed by the company. Sublette then decided upon their routes, dividing up his forces into camps, which took each its appointed course, detaching as it went small parties of trappers to all the hunting grounds in the neighborhood. Sublette himself now set forth to find Smith, who had agreed to meet him on the upper waters of the Snake River. He pushed up the Wind River, crossed the mountains, and entered the valley, now called Jackson's Hole, after the partner whom he found in camp there. For some time Sublette and Jackson waited at this point for Jedediah Smith. Finally growing uneasy, Sublette sent small parties out in various directions to search for the missing partner. One of these bands wandered into Pierre's Hole, an emerald cup set in its rim of Amistine Mountains, and there, with but four men, one of whom was Arthur Black, Smith was found trapping along the streams of the beautiful valley. He had spent the winter of 1828-29 at Fort Vancouver as the guest of the venerable Dr. McLaughlin, and in March he had resumed his journey toward the place of rendezvous, ascending the Columbia to a point near the Big Bend, thence striking out north and east to Flathead House, from whence, turning southward along the route he had followed with Ogden in the winter of 1824-25, he had reached Pierre's Hole. We are told that there was great rejoicing over the finding of Smith, and well might this be, though it is doubtful if the importance of what this man had accomplished was thoroughly understood by his comrades. His had been the first overland party of Americans to reach California. He had been the first white man to travel the central route from Salt Lake to the Pacific, and the first to traverse the full length of California and Oregon by land. Of the thirty-two men who had shared in his adventures, twenty-five had been slain by the Mojaves and the Umquas. During three years of wandering west of the Rockies, he had covered fourteen degrees of latitude and eleven degrees of longitude, it was one of the greatest western explorers that Sublette's men found trapping in Pierre's Hole that summer of 1829, and he was then but 31 years old. During his sojourn with Dr. McLaughlin at Fort Vancouver, Smith, by way of showing gratitude for the generosity of his host, had agreed that the firm of which he was a member should henceforth confine its operations to the country east of the Great Divide. Accordingly, after spending the balance of the summer in Pierre's Hole, the three partners crossed over to the headwaters of the Madison Fork of the Missouri. During the fall and early winter of 1829, the various parties of the firm worked the country lying between the sources of the Missouri and Yellowstone, finally going into winter quarters on the Wind River. While the camp was celebrating Christmas, William L. Sublette and Black Harris with a few dogs to carry their blankets and supplies, started on snowshoes for St. Louis. Sublette took with him a letter from Jed Smith to his brother Ralph of Ashtabula, Ohio, urging the latter to come west. Shortly after the departure of Sublette and Harris, the party on the Wind River, finding the pasturage there insufficient for the horses, moved to the Powder River. After much wandering and many stirring adventures during the spring and early summer of 1830, the party moved back to the valley of the Wind River, where the rendezvous of that year was to be held. 
on the tenth of july sublette arrived with eighty-one men mounted on mules ten loaded wagons drawn by five mule teams two dearborn buggies a milk cow and twelve head of steers the latter having been driven along as an insurance against famine until the buffalo country should be reached the wagons and buggies brought out by sublette that year were the first to trundle up the great natural road soon to be known as the oregon and california trail the wind river rendezvous of eighteen thirty was the last ever held by the firm of smith jackson and sublette for in the first week of august the business was sold to a new firm called the rocky mountain fur company and composed of thomas fitzpatrick milton g sublette a brother of william l henry frabe jean baptiste gervais and james bridger immediately after the sale smith jackson and sublette began the journey to st louis with one hundred ninety packs of beaver worth about eighty thousand dollars reaching the city in october eighteen thirty jed found his two brothers austin and peter awaiting his arrival ralph having been unable to leave home at that time the golden era of the rocky mountain fur trade was nearing its end and more and more the adventurous spirits of the frontier were becoming interested in the overland traffic with taos and santa fe new mexico until the beginning of the nineteenth century new mexico had received all its imported goods from vera cruz over a long and difficult trail but early in the century american merchants had begun to realize the fact that goods could be transported more cheaply to new mexico by way of the missouri river and the great plains than from any mexican port in eighteen o four one morrison a merchant of the old french town of kaskaskia succeeded in sending a pack train of merchandise to santa fe but lost the profits of his venture through the dishonesty of his agent other merchants followed the example of morrison but none attained any conspicuous success during the next seventeen years josiah gregg the principal authority on this unique phase of westward expansion tells us that the santa fe trade may be dated from the year eighteen twenty one when captain william becknell of missouri with four trusty companions went out to santa fe by the far western prairie route this band started from franklin a town on the missouri river two hundred miles above its mouth notwithstanding the trifling amount of merchandise they were possessed of says gregg they realized a handsome profit and thereafter the trade with santa fe increased rapidly in eighteen twenty two the value of merchandise transported westward across the prairies and the deserts was fifteen thousand dollars in eighteen twenty four thirty five thousand dollars in eighteen twenty five sixty five thousand dollars in eighteen twenty seven ninety thousand dollars in eighteen twenty eight one hundred fifty thousand dollars in eighteen thirty one two hundred and fifty thousand dollars up to the year eighteen twenty three pack animals alone were used in eighteen twenty four wagons were employed for the first time and after eighteen twenty six all traffic was by wagon it will be remembered that when jedediah smith first landed in st louis the great period of the fur trade was just beginning and men talked of little else than the fortunes that could be realized in that romantic industry eight years had passed since that time and now the santa fe trade was the talk of the town smith in company with his brothers peter and austin and his partners sublette and jackson decided to engage in this new business on april tenth eighteen thirty one the smith party consisting of eighty-five men started from st louis with twenty-two loaded wagons and a six-pound cannon traveling up the valley of the missouri river they met thomas fitzpatrick near lexington he was returning to st louis from the yellowstone country but was easily persuaded to accompany his old comrades to santa fe near the last of april the party reached the town of independence which though but four years old had already come to be the point of rendezvous for the santa fe traders as well as for the rocky mountain trappers formerly the town of franklin one hundred eighty seven miles downstream had been the point of departure but with the founding of independence in eighteen twenty seven the latter place was found to be more convenient being the westernmost settlement on the missouri a stream that was navigable for at least eight months during the year and offered a cheap and easy means of transportation from st louis 
on the fourth of may eighteen thirty one the wagon train of smith jackson and sublette moved out from independence on the road to santa fe with seven hundred seventy five miles of prairie wilderness ahead the first point of importance reached after leaving the border was council grove one hundred fifty miles out a wooded valley lying along a branch of the neosho river here it was customary for the westbound parties to halt for the purpose of electing officers deciding upon the order of march agreeing to the rules that should be obeyed and defining the duties that should be performed by each member josiah gregg who had started with a caravan for santa fe just eleven days after the departure of smith's party has left us a vivid account of the organization and personnel of these parties one would have supposed he writes that electioneering and party spirit would hardly have penetrated so far into the wilderness but so it was even in our little community we had our office seekers and their political adherents as earnest and devoted as any of the modern school of politicians in the midst of civilization when a captain of the caravan had been elected the business of organization began the proprietors were notified by proclamation to furnish a list of their men and wagons the latter were generally apportioned into four divisions to each of these divisions a lieutenant was appointed whose duty it was to inspect every ravine and creek on the route select the best crossings and superintend what is called in prairie parlance the forming of the caravan the wild and motley character of the caravan continues greg can be but imperfectly conceived without an idea of the costumes of the various members the most fashionable prairie dress is the fustian frock of the city-bred merchant furnished with a multitude of pockets capable of accommodating a variety of extra tackling then there is the backwoodsman with his linsey or leather hunting shirt the farmer with the blue jean coat the wagoner with his flannel sleeve vest besides an assortment of other costumes which go to fill up the picture in the article of firearms there is also an equally interesting medley the frontier hunter sticks to his rifle as nothing could induce him to carry what he terms in derision the scatter gun the sportsman from the interior flourishes his double-barrel fowling piece with equal confidence in its superiority the latter is certainly the most convenient description of a gun that can be carried on the journey as a charge of buckshot in night attacks which are the most common will of course be more likely to do execution than a single rifle ball fired at random a great many were furnished beside with a bountiful supply of pistols and knives of every description at the council grove the laborers were employed in procuring timber for axle trees and other wagon repairs of which a supply is always laid in before leaving this region of substantial growths for henceforward there is no wood on the route fit for these purposes not even in the mountains of santa fe do we meet with any serviceable timber the supply procured here is generally lashed under the wagons in which way a log is not infrequently carried to santa fe and even sometimes back again final preparations having been made at council grove the caravan began the journey in earnest greg tells us that when the nature of the country would permit it was customary to march in four columns and he remarks that a caravan proceeding in this manner presented a very fine and imposing spectacle in making camp for the night or in case of attack by indians during the day the wagons were thus easily placed in the most advantageous position for defense the exterior columns swinging outward and then meeting the two interior columns falling back and wheeling outward to form a quadrangle with the first two columns into the corral thus formed the animals were driven thus rendering a stampede impossible while protected by the hollow square of heavily loaded wagons the men were enabled to render a very good account of themselves in case of a scrimmage the caravan of smith jackson and sublette pushed forward rapidly reaching the ford of the arkansas river three hundred ninety two miles west of independence in about three weeks thus far no considerable difficulties had been encountered and though they had lost one man who had strayed away from the main body and been killed by pawnees they had every reason to be in the best of spirits for they had now covered slightly more than half the distance to santa fe however they were now about to enter upon the most difficult stage of the whole journey 
after crossing the arkansas the route led for a distance of over sixty miles across a region of utter desolation to the forks of the cimarron river this tract of country says greg may truly be styled the grand prairie ocean for not a single landmark is to be seen for more than forty miles scarcely a visible eminence by which to direct one's course all is as level as the sea and the compass was our surest as well as our principal guide before entering this desert it was customary to lay in a good supply of water smith and his comrades seemed to have neglected this precaution hoping doubtless to find occasional water holes but the summer of eighteen thirty one was unusually dry and no water holes were found within two days after striking out from the arkansas the party began to experience the tortures of thirst and the famished animals began to die confused by a maze of buffalo trails that led nowhere taunted and misled by lying mirages smith and his comrades struggled onward we will let josiah gregg tell the rest of the melancholy story he had it from a mexican buffalo hunter who in turn had been told by the comanche indians themselves protagonists in the final act of the tragedy in this perilous situation captain smith resolved at last to pursue one of the seductive buffalo paths in hopes it might lead to the margin of some stream or pond he set out alone for besides the temerity which desperation always inspires he had ever been a stranger to fear indeed he was one of the most undaunted spirits that had ever traversed the rocky mountains but alas for unfortunate captain smith after having so often dodged the arrow and eluded the snare of the wily mountain indian little could he have thought while jogging along under a scorching sun that his bones were destined to bleach upon those arid sands he had already wandered many miles away from his comrades when on turning over an eminence his eyes were joyfully greeted with the appearance of a small stream meandering through the valley that spread before him it was the cimarron he hurried forward to slake the fire of his parched lips but imagine his disappointment at finding in the channel only a bed of dry sand with his hands however he soon scratched out a basin a foot or two deep into which the water slowly oozed from the saturated sand while with his head bent down in the effort to quench his burning thirst he was pierced by arrows of a gang of comanches who were lying in wait for him yet he struggled bravely to the last and as the indians themselves have since related killed two or three of their party before he was overpowered thus on the twenty seventh of may eighteen thirty one died jedediah strong smith at the age of thirty three no monument marks the spot where this great western explorer met his end his bones were picked by the wolves and crows and left to bleach in the arid bed of the cimarron until the next freshet should bury them in the sands at winter quarters on the wind river in december eighteen twenty nine smith had written as follows to his brother ralph and no man who knew him ever questioned his sincerity it is that i may be able to help those who stand in need that i face every danger it is for this that i pass over the sandy plains in heat of summer thirsting for water where i may cool my overheated body it is for this that i go for days without eating and am pretty well satisfied if i can gather a few roots a few snails or better satisfied if we can afford ourselves a piece of horse flesh or a fine roasted dog and most of all it is for this that i deprive myself of the privilege of society and the satisfaction of the converse of my friends let his own words be his epitaph end of chapter twenty one end of the splendid wayfaring the story of the exploits and adventures of jedediah smith and his comrades the ashley henry men discoverers and explorers of the great central route from the missouri river to the pacific ocean 1822 to 1831 by john g nyhart